everybody, welcome. I'm so glad to see you at the last discovery oh, okay. lecture of the semester. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, I'm very, very excited. Well, generally speaking, I'm very, very excited, but I'm especially specifically excited today because I can't wait to introduce you to the person who's gonna to talk to us. She's amazing. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you scan the QR code for attendance, grab a snack, grab a snack on your way out too. It's a long day and we're all hungry. Okay, I'm gonna start off with our land acknowledgement and remind you that founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land, land throughout the generations and also our, acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. All right, thank you so much for being here. I wanna introduce you to this amazing human being Gabrielle Dietrich, she's the executive director of NAMI New Mexico. So she knows everything and really, really cares about your mental health and my mental health. Um, she's the co-founder and conductor of El Faro um, Youth Chorus, which is the first ever trauma-informed choral ensemble. For over 20 years, she's been helping young people find their voices as, as a conductor, a voice teacher, and professor of music in Cal California, Colorado, Hungary, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and here in New Mexico. Through her personal experiences as a young chorister and her work with undeserved, underserved youth, Dr. Dietrich has experienced singing as a powerful means of self-expression, a vehicle for building social skills and healthy friendships, and a catalyst for healing the effects of trauma. These experiences have led her to her current work in the mental health space, and she is grateful for the opportunity to learn, grow, and contribute in this community. So I think, we could give her a thunderous, honorous round of applause and thank her for being here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today and thank you for that very lovely introduction. Um, so my name is Gabrielle Dietrich, most people call me Gabby, and I'm really thrilled to be able to talk with you about one of my favorite topics, which is my work with my youth chorus, which is specific to trauma-informed practice. So before we kind of get into all that, I want to talk to you a little bit about where I come from and why this is so important to me. So I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I was the second of four kids and both my parents had undiagnosed mental illnesses and my sister has autism and intellectual disability. So a lot of chaos in the family, a lot of, um, I was definitely kind of an invisible kid within within the, that context. I was the one who kind of held things together, did laundry, did, made dinner. Like I, that was kind of my role. I was pretty parentified from a pretty young age, and uh, there was a lot of things that went on that went on in that household that were really not great for me. I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that kind of a story. And I had this one place that I got to go to where I felt okay, and that was my choir. I sang in a, in a homeschooled girls chorus um, and it was, it was just my haven. It was the place that I went to, to feel safe. It was the place that I went to, to be able to express who I was separate from all of the identities that went with growing up in my house. So I didn't have to do laundry there. I didn't have to like take care of people there. I just got to like be a soprano and enjoy my life. And that was so important to me that I eventually graduated and went to college in California and studied music, eventually became a music education major, went up through graduate school, studied choral conducting, um, went to Hungary, studied some more music education, came back, worked for a while, did, and then, and then went back for yet even more graduate school because, you know, it's nothing like being a glutton for punishment, right? And uh, came away with my doctorate in choral music and taught at Penn State for, for nine years. And through that experience and all along the way, I worked with young people who came from backgrounds kind of like mine and from backgrounds significantly rougher than mine, where their experience in their life 
may, wasn't necessarily safe for them. They weren't necessarily safe at home. They weren't necessarily safe in their schools. They didn't feel good about where they were in the world. And it was so meaningful to me to create a space for them where they could be who they were. And I didn't really know very much about that other than I just love these kids and I, you know, I tried to love them in the best way that I knew how. I was still kind of fixated on doing things the best way, you know, like we're going to sing the best music and we're going to sing the, mu the, the, the best music in the best way possible. And that's what matters and check your problems at the door. But here, you know, you, 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 can, you can have a great experience. So it was still pretty centralized in the way that I thought of structure and power dynamic and all that kind of stuff. Cause that's how I was taught. That's, that's what I came through academia really believing about how you do choir. And then the pandemic happened and I had this really important opportunity to stop and look at my practice. Like, look what I had, look at what I had done this far and think about what maybe wasn't I doing? What needs was I not meeting through the way that I was choosing to teach? And I read this book called The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Any of you read this book? It's, it's a really, it's a tough read. There's very hard, very sad stories in that book. Um, I highly recommend the audio book because it's a little easier to absorb in, in a lot of ways. The actual book has some, some really interesting graphics and statistics and things like that. So if you're interested in that, in that kind of like psychology, like um, trauma sort of world, it's, it's a really, it's a really important book to, to check, to look into. Um, but again, trigger warning, it's, there's some really sad stuff in that book. And it really um, made me see myself in, in a different way. Like reading that book made me see myself in those pages. And he talks about his patients who have suffered trauma going to choirs and the theater programs and to athletic teams and finding this great sense of purpose and this sense of belonging and how important it was for them. And I started really thinking, oh my gosh, there's such an opportunity within this thing that I do, within this music that I make to be a positive force. And I definitely wasn't thinking about all of that in quite, in quite the ways that I could have. And so I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have stopped and thought about that. And the idea for a trauma-informed chorus really came from that. I moved to New Mexico and in October of 2021, El Fadero Youth Chorus was formed. And so that's kind of the origin story of all of this. We are the first ever trauma-informed chorus, the first ever trauma-informed music ensemble of any kind, actually. And it's it's right here, it's in Albuquerque. We serve uh, young people from age seven up through age 18. And we have all kinds of practices woven into what we do that make our environment as safe as it can possibly be, because that's really our purpose, is to make music with excellence and to learn with excellence, but also to recognize that our common humanity, both of the conductor, of the pianist, of the chaperones, and of the, the students themselves, is what has to be at the center in order for everybody to do the best work. So are any of you familiar with the term trauma-informed? Is this a, a, a term that's familiar to any of you? Yeah? I, I would like to propose as a working definition that trauma-informed means an environment or practice that puts human safety and wellness and health in the center, right? So it's not kind of, oh yeah, well, we're safe, but we have this other thing to do. No, we put safety in the center of the room and acknowledge it in the ways that we choose to do things. And I'm not saying that any environment that doesn't do that is intrinsically bad. What I'm saying is that when you do it on purpose, you can do it with more, um, with more thoroughness would probably be the way that I think about it. So in when, you, when we say the word trauma, a lot of times that kind of gets people thinking about really sad stories or really sad things. And that is often what, what is caused by trauma. Trauma specifically, not just have experiencing an unfortunate experience, right? Having something happen to you that was negative, but rather trauma in the sense that your brain and your body, a part of it still believes that it's still that you're still there and it's still happening to you. So trauma isn't something bad happened to you. Trauma is the after effect of your brain and your body not knowing that you're not there anymore. That's, the, that's, where, that's where the real kind of kicker comes in. So when we talk about dealing with folks with trauma, we're not talking about as somebody who like 
had their caramel macchiato made the wrong way. Or we're not, and we're also not talking about somebody who was in a car accident necessarily. You can be in a car accident and be shaken up, but not necessarily have trauma. Or you can be in a car accident and come away from it with a lot of like startle and a lot of trouble that lasts for a long, long period of time. So we throw the word trauma around or traumatic around, and it has a really specific meaning and another generic meaning. So kind of sorting those things out in your, in your minds is a, is a useful thing to do. So in a trauma-informed learning environment, what do we not do? We do not do group therapy. We do not do diagnosis. We do not do treatment. Why? Well, because the people who structure a trauma-informed environment are not necessarily mental health practitioners. I am not a mental health practitioner. I, I am trained in music. You, you got to hear all about my little bio and my little life story. None of that said, trained as a mental health practitioner. So it's really important not to practice without a license, but you can still know about things and practices that you can put in place to protect the safety and health of folks that you're with. So we're not doing diagnosis treatment. I am not a therapist. Um, we don't ask for participants' trauma stories, which is kind of interesting, right? It's a trauma-informed environment. You'd think, oh, well, people are going to come in and talk about what happened to them. Not necessarily, because that's not the point. You know, there's there's a reason to process trauma in talk therapy in various places in your life. To come to a trauma-informed environment, if you feel safe talking to a person about what happened to you, that's totally fine. But I'm not going to make anybody check their trauma at the door and like, you know, say, oh, can you be a member of my club? Are you sufficiently traumatized to be here? Like, that would be kind of gross, right? So um, it's not necessarily true that anybody who comes in through the door has to have, you know, you must be this traumatized to ride the ride. Instead, it's, we come, we all come through life with our scars and with our troubles and a trauma-informed environment is actually com compassionate and helpful for everyone, whether you're just having a hard time on an average Tuesday or you are surviving something of a, of a really heavy magnitude. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, we don't set aside structure, educational goals, or the pursuit of excellence. And I think um, this word excellence has often meant at different times and in different places, like, self-abnegation, right? So the, the situation where you are a floating head and what's happening in your body or what's happening in your history or what's even what's happening in your emotions is secondary. You are just purely a floating cerebral cortex and you're here to just like jam as much into that cortex as you possibly can and push as much productivity out of it as you can. Guess what? It doesn't work so good, right? How, how many of you do your best work when you're stressed out, exhausted, hungry? <laughs> but, and, and if you do your best work under those circumstances, you may, it, it's possible that you might think you do, but guess what? You don't. Because anybody familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs? We're going to talk about that in a little bit, in a little bit as well. So the idea is not that through having a trauma-informed environment, we just hold everybody's hand all the time and give them a juice box. I mean, I'm all for hand-holding a juice box if that's what you want, but that's not, it's not necessarily true that a trauma-informed learning environment is watered down. The idea is that we address people's felt needs so that then they are free to work in the, in the best way that they know how. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we do not only engage with material about trauma or other sad topics in a trauma-informed environment. Like you can be in a trauma-informed environment and ideally you would not necessarily be able to tell from the outside whether you were or whether you weren't. Right. So you wouldn't necessarily look at one of my rehearsals and say, oh, that's a trauma informed choir. You'd probably just look at it and say, oh, that's a choir. And she does things a little bit different, but, you know, it's just choir. And I, and I think that's by design. It's not just that we're trying to telegraph all the time. This is what we're thinking about. And we're very serious and everyone's a little sad and we all know it. It's not like that. Instead, we're just, again, putting human safety and wellness in the center. Um, we don't insist that everybody is having a good day or that everybody learns things the same way. And, oh, sorry, are you good? I think it's going around, okay. Um, we don't insist that everybody has to learn everything the same way. Have any of you just discovered in your lives that people don't learn everything exactly the same way, that you don't learn everything the same way as the people around you? Of course you have, because you're humans. And I think um, it's, there's something that happens in groups of people called co-regulation. Have you ever heard about this? So co-regulation would mean that, so I come into the room today and I'm feeling terrible, but the rest of y'all, you know, you're kind of doing okay-ish, right? What's likely gonna happen is not that I'm gonna like drag everybody down with my not okayness. Instead, 
you all with your kind of mild to moderate okayness can kind of pull me up because we as human beings, as social animals, we mirror one another. We have these things in our heads called mirror neurons. And so if you're walking into a room full of happy people, you're going to become happier too. Not because of mind control or hysteria or anything like that. It's just because of the way that our brains are wired to imitate others. And so this co-regulatory function is really important and can really have a really positive act, like impact on folks. Um, in a trauma-informed environment, we do not encourage competition. That's, that's something specific to me. You can certainly have like a trauma-informed soccer team or something where, where competition was woven into it. But in, in terms of, you know, whoever has to, like you have to perform at this level in order to be worthy, in order to belong, in order to be a part of it, is kind of inimical to the whole idea of being trauma-informed. Does that make sense? So if you're if you're out to like, push yourself into a place in the boat and push somebody else out. If you think of learning as a zero sum game, that's automatically gonna push things to kind of a not so healthy place, if that makes sense to you. So I personally love, like when I see within my chorus, one of the kids gets a solo, right? They all try, you know, some several kids try out, one of the kids gets a solo. One of the proudest moments for me is when the rest of the kids are like, you did so good. We're so proud of you. That's so awesome. And believe it or not, I'm like in a room full of middle schoolers, this happens fairly often because that's the culture that has been set up that we root for each other. We're not like out to get each other or to claim our spots when somebody else can't have it. Instead, we all kind of work together, which sounds pretty handholdy and like unicorns and rainbowy, but it, it works. It actually happens. So I'm just telling you. Um, the idea of a centralized power dynamic, which is pretty kind of old school when you think about how education is set up, right? When you imagine your typical classroom, there's somebody like me standing up here talking at you and you're there to learn and I'm an expert and you don't know anything and that's how it is. Does that make you feel good? No, probably not. So the idea of a trauma-informed environment also includes decentralizing some of the power and making the whole environment more interactive, giving people choice giving people the ability to say, yes, I want to be a part of this, or no, I don't want to be a part of it, and embracing that as part of the, of the issue. I like to tell the story of my choir back in Pennsylvania, where I had a student who, she came to us uh, with intellectual disabilities from, from the beginning. She, great singer, had a lovely time with us. We had a really wonderful experience. It was, it was great. And the other, the other choristers would kind of help her along and that was wonderful. And then one day she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. She experienced her first incidence of psychosis, um, meaning that she was having auditory and visual hallucinations and had to be hospitalized. It was a really, it was a really rough time for her. And so she dropped out of chorus for a while and then came back. And we had to kind of develop a protocol where if she was in distress, she, we, there was, there was a thing that would happen, right? We had a production manager who would come and sit with her and create a, a place that was safe for her to kind of calm down, recover and come back. And so it just became the rule that it was okay for her to get up and go. Everybody knew it is what it is. And the, the really beautiful thing that came out of that was Katie, because of, of who she is, she would raise her hand and she would say, Dr. B, I need to leave because the voices are really bugging me today. And in this room full of, again, middle and high schoolers, it was normalized at that point to say that something is happening to me that nobody else can see. I am having an experience that others do not share and it's really bothering me. And she felt safe enough to say that. And the rest of the, and the, rest of the folks in the room were just like, Oh, Katie's voices are bugging her. She's 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 got to she's got to leave the room. She's got to go take care of that. And so, normalizing this experience of people having experiences that others can't see is so powerful because it helps you like imagine a world where we don't have to isolate folks or be afraid of folks who are having these kinds of experiences. Instead, we can just create an opportunity and a place for them to be safe, for them to take care of what they need to take care of and to rejoin as they're able. And I, I was so proud of that, that that was an experience that my students had. And I was so grateful to Katie for like giving us that window into herself when a lot of people wouldn't have done that. And so I think when you decentralize power and you empower people to take care of what they need to take care of, those are the kind of things that become possible. Um, 
I like this. I've added this this uh, last one to my handout. I've, I've given a version of this presentation before, and I think this is really important. One of the things we don't do in a trauma-informed environment is pretend that teachers or students have to be right in order to be worthy. Because I'm sure you've noticed, teachers make mistakes. And the ones who struggle with that most are usually the ones who don't feel that they're allowed to. And I'm sure at times you may have had the experience of being in a, in a class with a professor who makes an error and then gets mad at themselves because they made the error and then takes it on the class, right? And makes it your problem that it happened. And in the kind of centralized power dynamic, there is a lot of pressure to behave in that way. And it's really not healthy because it makes you guys feel terrible. Also, on from, from the other standpoint, when people make mistakes, it's generally an opportunity to learn a thing, not generally an opportunity to like browbeat people. And I think when you create an environment where that's true, where mistakes are welcomed as an opportunity to learn and not as an opportunity to like bang you over the head, I think a, a lot of really beautiful things can come out. We And many, all of us at this point are victims of this culture where high stakes testing, dot scribbling is the, the, the lay of the land, right? You're supposed to have the right answer and that's it and that's all. And the struggle to get from an idea that maybe doesn't work to an idea that works better is a process that a lot of us are sort of unfamiliar with because it's just, it's right or it's wrong, it's true or it's false, as opposed to, well, you gotta kind of like massage it a little bit as you go along to get there. And being able to embrace that process through being able to embrace mistakes makes people a lot smarter and makes people a lot better able to handle the world writ large. Does this all make some, making sense to you so far? So those are all the don'ts. Those are the things that we don't do in a trauma-informed learning environment. Now, in a trauma-informed choral ensemble, because that's my, that's my, the water that I swim in, I swim in choir land, that's where I am. Um, one of the things that we have really found post-pandemic is that reestablishing social connections has been super important. So. The thing one that we do is we have fun and we value social engagement. Um, we use an open rehearsal model rather than a tradition, traditional audition model. How many of you have ever had the experience of auditioning for something? Okay, how, how, how much fun do you have auditioning? <laughs> Zero percent fun? <laughs> Maybe three or 30 or 40 percent fun, but, but, but mostly majority probably terror, right? And so I personally feel that especially among young people, when you make, when you put the pressure on them to perform, especially for a person that they do not know, you're automatically taking like however much off the top of what they're really able to do. Whereas if you put people in a position where they're comfortable and they get to experience the environment as it would actually be, so this is what the open rehearsal thing looks like, the, a, a, new, a new singer comes in at the beginning of the semester, with the group that's already there. They go through a couple of rehearsals, they experience it, they, they figure out whether this is something that's gonna work for them, whether it's something they enjoy, whether it's something that's right for them, whether they're ready for it. Then we have a conversation at the end of that process, me, their parent, whoever, and say, hey, is this gonna work for you or do you think it's not gonna work for you? And no push either way. And the, the outcome of that has been consistently, like, and I've done this for a long time, the, outcome of that has consistently been, I get more successful stays from folks who do an open, like an open rehearsal model rather than an audition model, because we don't, we take fear out of the, out of the process. Like it's still a little intimidating to walk into a new room with new people, but it's a heck of a lot less intimidating than like staring me down when I'm a stranger and saying, okay, so you want to sing something for me? Like it's, it sounds, it sounds pretty terrifying because it is. So we try and demystify it a little bit and try and make it a little bit less um, forbidding. And honestly, it works better because we, it's a better predictor of success. Um, we teach body awareness and, and encourage emotional self-regulation. Y'all are aware probably at least in some aspect of your lives that when you feel a strong emotion, it shows up in your body. It shows up as a, as a physical sensation in the world of trauma. This is even more true. A lot of times folks who, um, experience trauma, in kind of a clinical sense, right? So this idea that part of their body and part of their mind is always stuck in the bad place, wherever the bad thing happened. Oftentimes, one of two things happens. Either one, the only thing they can remember about what happened is the sensation and it's stuck in their body and they know it. 
Number two, they don't feel anything. They're just like unable to like assess for themselves. Am I comfortable? Am I uncomfortable? Am I feeling pain? Am I not feeling pain? And so teaching folks to be aware of themselves and to be conscious of their bodily sensations is also a gateway for being able to unlock uh, health, healthy emotional self-regulation. And in the world of singing, you can probably tell that's going to be even more valuable because if you're aware of your body and where it is in space, you're going to have a lot easier time singing. How many of you are singers? I'm not going to make you sing, I promise. A couple, right? Here or there. So when you sing, you have to be aware of your body, correct? You have to know how, how tall your mouth is open. You have to know how big of a breath to take. There are things about it that are very much physical. And the more awareness you have of those aspects of physicality, the better sound that you're able to make. It's just kind of a, a thing that, that happens. How many of you are aware of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems? Okay. Okay. So the sympathetic nervous system is what? What does it do? Something scary happens. What does the what does the sympathetic nervous system do do for you? Yeah. Is that fight or flight? It is fight or flight, and there's actually freeze or fawn as well. There's four Fs, right? So something scary happens, and your brain is going to tell your body to do one of four things. And when I say your brain, I don't mean your cerebral cortex, like the part of your brain that does like its best thinking. I'm talking about your lizard brain, right? This is your limbic system. This is where the emotional part of things happen. It's not really lizard, it's more like mammal brain. So your mammal brain is going to choose one of these four options, right? You're either gonna fight off what's what's getting you, you're gonna run away, you're gonna freeze and hope it and hope it ends sometime soon, or and fawn is pretty specific to humans, you're gonna make yourself helpful so that the thing that's threatening you chooses another target. So when that happens, right? How are you feeling at that point? Like, are you, are you ready to do your best work when one of those things is going on? No, because your, your, your body is in a, in a like state of stress and a cycle begins that needs to complete, right? So you need to run, you need to move, something needs to happen, you need to like scream, something needs to happen to like dissipate all of that. Or your body can hold it in for like years and years and then you wind up feeling really sick. But one of these four things, once it's activated, there's a cycle that needs to complete, right? What does the parasympathetic nervous system do? Anybody know? Rest and digest. Rest and digest, very nice. So these systems are connected. So the parasympathetic nervous system is roughly the antagonist to the sympathetic nervous system, it's the brakes, this is the gas. This is an oversimplification, but that's the basic kind of understanding of things. So when you breathe in, a little part of you is activating a little bit of the sympathetic nervous system because you're getting ready to run, you're getting ready to do whatever it is that you need to do next. When you exhale, you're activating the brakes. So when you exhale, particularly exhale slowly, let's all take a big breath in. Do a slow exhale. It's real relaxing, right? Let's breathe in for four and out for eight. You ready? Breathing in. Out for eight. You can feel in your body that that's good, right? That there's, that there's something about that that just intrinsically feels good. And it's nice that in the world of singing, singing is effectively what? It's effectively a slow exhalation. So there's a reason why you're drawn to activities that include like slow exhales. It's playing a wind instrument would be another, would be another example of this. That when you exhale slowly, you are calming your body down. And it's something that you don't choose to do. It's something that your brain does all by itself. And so this idea of body awareness of being conscious of the ways in which what you do affects you physically is, is really important and you can carry it with you into the whole rest of your life. Um, we really, in my course, are in, it's very important to model and use person-centered language and respect for identities and opinions. So we, we have pronoun pins that we put on the piano at the very beginning. We are really careful when we talk about, um, for example, lately, we sometimes we see music that's in Arabic, sometimes we see music that's in Hebrew, and we have to reckon with the fact that these languages bring up this conflict that's that's happening, it's immediate, it's now. And 
reckon with the idea that people have these very strong emotions related to that and figure out a way to all coexist within those very strong opinions and those very strong emotions. And it's part of it. Like it's, it's part of the experience of being in a trauma informed environment. If it needs to be safe, it needs to be safe for everybody. Um, we practice collaboration and empowerment of learners. Um, and you're gonna see later on that I talk about collaboration versus anarchy. So kind of hold a mental note in your head because collaboration means working together, right? But if you give people power over the wrong things, if you ask people to be in charge of things they're not ready to be in charge of, then you're gonna wind up with a whole other situation. We're gonna talk about that in just a minute. Um, learn about and reflect upon the origin stories and the music that we sing, like I just spoke about with the language issues. Um, I think it's really important to recognize that when we sing, when we perform music, when we engage with art of any kind, we're effectively going through a little like time warp slash place warp to a place in a time that's different than where we are right now. And the more thoroughly we understand that place in that time, the more meaningful that connection becomes. Um, I really, I think it's very important to use pedagogical techniques that both honor the traditions where the music comes from and the, and the learning approaches of the people who are learning it. So what this looks like, all that's a lot of words that, that boils down to something a little more simple. Um, when you learn a song from the radio, right? You're listening to a song on the radio. How, like, how are you learning it? Like, do, are you like printing out the sheet music and like learning the words that way? No, how are you learning? How are you learning music from the radio generally? Through your ears, right? You're just listening and repeating because that's how that style of music by and large is learned, is, pa is passed from person to person. Now, if you study a musical instrument or you study choral music, how do you usually learn music in that environment? Sheet music, right? So it's, no it's notated. And is it true that every choral culture throughout the world or across time has used sheet music to transmit music from one person to another? No, not at all, right? And so is it more respectful? Is it more authentic to learn music that comes from a non-notation oriented culture from notation? Or is it more authentic to learn it the way that people have learned it for a long time? Choice B, correct? And believe it or not, it's usually more effective because if the music is structured for ear repetition, it usually doesn't sit so well in notation and vice versa. Like you probably could pe teach people Beethoven's Ninth Symphony by ear, but you might be hard pressed. It's, it really exists in this notational world. And similarly, you can teach people to repeat like the improvisatory jazz solos of whichever artist, Ella Fitzgerald, you can, you can do that, like you can notate it, I've had to, it's horrible, but it's not the most effective or, or efficient way to do it. It's just kind of like a parlor trick. So you're much better off sticking to the origin of the music and learning it the way that it was intended to be learned because it means more to you and it sticks better. Does this make sense? Cool. Um, and also the other kind of advantage of that is some of us are real good at learning things by ear and some of us are real good at like sight reading, right? This is just the way that it goes. And isn't it better to have everybody have a chance to be a rock star? You know what I mean? So if you are a visually oriented person, your moment is when the sheet music comes out. If you're an aurally oriented person, then your moment is when the aural stuff comes out. And that way it's not just that one set of skills is worthwhile and the other is not. Instead at different times, different skill sets come to bear and in a choral ensemble, then everybody benefits, right? So I don't just have to know everything all for myself. I know it again in a co-regulatory way with all of you. Um, building one another up, I talked about that a little bit already. We cheer for each other when we do well. We hold each other up when we're struggling. Like these things are both equally true and equally important. Emphasizing consent and safety. Um, one of the things that is really important in our ensemble is that we always have two adults in the room with the young people so that we don't have any sort of issue with something happening to a kid that shouldn't be happening to a kid. Um, we do a very active parent communication. We try to be really, really conscious of those issues because it really matters. Um, welcoming mistakes and taking responsibility for our behavior and feelings. Um, that is actually more about the teachers than the students. Often the students are sort of ready to get out there and create because they're young enough that the world hasn't like beat them up so much yet in, the, in, in that way. They might've been beaten up in other ways, but they're not, 
they're usually ready to splash around and make a mistake in the realm of music, right? And the idea of welcoming mistakes is often harder for people who have been out in the world learning how to do really sophisticated stuff with from really sophisticated people who maybe haven't embraced this kind of way of looking at the world, right? And so the work of welcoming mistakes and taking responsibility for the way that mistakes make us feel is more about the teacher's work than the student's work. It's much harder for teachers to deal with it, I think, than, than for students, which is which is interesting to me. Being, um, it was pretty revelatory the moment when I realized that I had, I had uh, feelings in the classroom, not because of what was happening per se, but because of how I felt about what was happening. So I was having feelings about my feelings basically, which is really, very complicated and probably not a great use of anybody's time. So acknowledging that and realizing that it is what it is and calling it out for what it is gives you the power to change it. Um, and why is this important? So now we get to Maslow. So the hierarchy of needs includes what? What's at the bottom level of Maslow? What do you need first? Food, shelter. Food, shelter, basic safety, right? Yes. So. We got, oh, sorry, I lied, you're right. Food and shelter, going to the bathroom, all those kind of things, physiological base level. Safety is next level up, right? Next level of that, love, love and belonging, being connected to other people, esteem, respect, right? For yourself and for others. And at the top level, self-actualization, becoming the person that you truly wanna be, right? So you can't skip. You gotta, you gotta go from the ground floor. So if you have kids who are coming in, they didn't sleep last night, are they going to self-actualize? No, they are not, right? You can maybe get away with it for a while, right? You can pull one all-nighter and maybe get through a day. But if you're consistently not sleeping well, are you gonna be doing your best work? No, you are not. If you are consistently in an environment where you are feeling unsafe, are you gonna do your best work? No, you are not. If you are consistently in a situation where you feel like you don't belong where you are, you're, you're not, you're not gonna do your best work. You're just not going to, right? And so, Again, this idea of a trauma-informed environment and addressing emotions as real things is not like hand-holdy or touchy-feely, it's smart. And out of a sense of enlightened self-interest, it would behoove all of us to see the world in this way, that humans are humans and humans have needs. And if we address those needs, humans can do their best. If we choose not to address those needs, humans might do pretty well, but you're gonna do a lot of damage. There's gonna be a lot of stuff in the, in the wake of that. And so thinking about things in the sense of, we address people's needs, not because we're touchy feely or hippy dippy, but we address people's needs because it's what gets the job done the best. And that was a lightning bolt moment for me to, to come to that place. And so I, I hope that that is something that you can take away from this experience as well. Um, there are, there are some trauma-informed principles that are kind of widely recognized, and I put them on here under this next point just so you could kind of have them. So the kind of typical formula is empowerment, choice, collaboration, safety, and trustworthiness. That's kind of the typical ingredients. If you start reading about trauma-informed stuff, these are the things that tend to be set up there. This, and the article that I reference here, it's in, it's in my bibliography. It's in a journal called Coral Journal. And it really just talks about how to, you know, like not misgender your students, how to provide trigger warnings if you're going to talk about something really intense, like kind of basic stuff. So that's a way to be trauma informed and to have procedures, but it's not really about pedagogy per se, pedagogy meaning the practice of teaching. It's not embedded in the teaching. That's kind of, to my mind, a procedural level of things. But when you start getting into the nitty gritty of recognizing the ways in which you teach, like recognizing that when you teach music in a way that that references cultural origin, that is when you when you start embedding it into the practice of pedagogy itself. So procedure is at one level and it's kind of basic, and pedagogy is something else and it's kind of next level and it's a little more subtle, if that makes sense at all. Um, anybody know about uh, adverse childhood experiences? Is this your ACE score? You've heard about this before, right? And having an ACE score of one puts you at this much risk for lifelong illness. Having an ACE score of four or more puts you at this risk, right? 
Do you know which state in the United States has the highest level of ACEs per capita? It's here. New Mexico has the high, it's tied with Arizona for having the highest rate of adverse childhood experiences in the nation. And that could be for a variety of reasons, uh, partly because it's, it's a largely rural state and domestic abuse is more common in rural areas. Um, it's, also, it's also because there's a lot of poverty in New Mexico. Um, there's, there's all kinds of factors that make this the case. But the reality is the place that we live is hungry and thirsty for this kind of thinking and this kind and, and addressing it like intelligently and out loud. So I think knowing that statistic is both really sad and really empowering. Um, Cause I think we need to realize the ways in which most of the people around us have, have significantly suffered and we don't see it, we don't know. Like you probably don't know the like most horrible thing that's happened to most of the people that you interact with on a daily basis. And the point here is to be kind. Make sense? Cool. Um, protective factors would be the other side of that, right? So if you're a young person, you're having a bad experience, but your next door neighbor is this really nice person, this really safe person, you know you can go over there and get a peanut butter jelly sandwich and watch Prices Right with her you're gonna have a lot better shot of surviving whatever's happening within the four walls of your house if you know that you have at least one safe adult in your life, right? I had one of those, my Aunt Ray, she, she lived next door to me. She was born in 1898. And if you would have asked me when I was six years old, I would have told you she was my best friend. And we, and we watched The Price is Right together and, and ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And her house was, was another one of my little refuges. And again, I credit her and I credit choir with the things that made me okay. And I bet most of us in this room can think back on times or places in our lives where we had a little refuge. Honestly, this place feels like a little refuge to me. I hope some of you feel that way about this place. Um, so a protective factor is just anything that creates kind of a counterbalance to whatever might be happening, right? And so the more we can create spaces where people have a place of refuge, the better off everybody's gonna be, the better chance you have surviving an adverse experience without having it either calcify into trauma or if trauma's already there, the better chance you have of being able to survive it, get through it, process it, move through it. Um, so I already talked about The Body Keeps the Score. This book is pretty profound. It's pretty important. Um, it has a counterpart called um, Trauma and Recovery that's written by Judith Herman. That's also in my bibliography. Um, Van der Kolk's view is very much about how trauma affects the individual. Herman's view is very much about how trauma affects society and is caused by society. She is very much like about feminist consciousness raising kind of stuff, talking about how patriarchal society impacts everyone and creates a situation in which power is centralized. It's not great for people. If you're interested in that kind of thing, she is, that, that book is also pretty profound. And whichever way you slice it, by changing the way that we interact with one another socially and by changing the way that learning environments are, we have the power to help support folks with us who have had these adverse experiences. Um, the polyvagal theory, have any of you heard of this? Is this something that's familiar to anybody? Anybody heard of the vagus nerve? Yeah, okay. So there's, there's two sections of the vagus nerve. There is the dorsal vagus and the, I forget what the other one is. Anyway, there's two sections of the vagus nerve. One, connects more to the sympathetic nervous system, the other to the parasympathetic nervous system. Stephen Porges' theory is that certain frequencies actually connect you to through the vagus nerve and other things like, seriously, vocal frequencies, vocal music, connect you to either the rest and digest part of things or the fight or flight part of things. And so he has this um, protocol called the safe and sound protocol where you listen to certain um, vocal music that he, spec he specifically filtered out the lower frequencies from them. And it's been like, he, he has studies that are showing that it helps people recover from anxiety, from depression, from trauma. It's pretty impressive stuff. And I thought it was pretty interesting to hear that his theory posits the low frequencies remind us of predators from an evolutionary standpoint, right? You have, you have like the low growling sound and that means you're supposed to run away and that high frequencies remind us of safety. 
And so that's his whole kind of theory. It's related to the, to the, to the vagus nerve. It's pretty complex. If I read it yesterday, I could tell you about, tell you more about it, but it's been a couple of weeks. So I would say, check that out. It's really, it's some very interesting stuff. And again, it ties into sort of what I do in, in the realm of choral things. Um, collaboration versus anarchy. How many of you have been in a situation where, like in a club or whatever, where the person who's supposed to be in charge is like, man, I don't, I don't want to be in charge. Let's all just like do it together and, 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 and nobody will be the leader. We'll all just kind of do things all together. How, how well does that usually work? T badly, right? So I, I just want to make sure, I want to underscore that having a leader doesn't necessarily mean centralized authority. If you have a leader who knows how to share power, that's often really one of the best ways to work. So it's not just pure anarchy, like nobody's in charge. It's instead this idea that someone creates a menu of options and then folks order off the menu. In the same way that if you walked into a restaurant and there was no menu and the person just said to you, well, what would you like to eat today? And, and they're like, and you'd be like, well, what are you making? And they'd be like, I don't know, what do you want to eat? It could be that you really felt like eating a grilled cheese that day and it'd be fine. Or you could have walked in and not known what you wanted and again, like chaos would ensue. So the um, I, I'm talking to a friend of mine from grad school who has a, um, she, she's working through a situation at the school where she teaches where um, the students want to be in charge of who auditions for the the course that she conducted, that she conducts and whether or not they get in. And then they like, as choristers, like who are also sort of officers for this club, they hear people sing and then they all kind of get together afterwards and talk smack about who's good and who's not. And then people are supposed to sort of come into that ensemble and feel safe at all, knowing that these conversations have been had about them from their peers. I, you know, this, this seems pretty dysfunctional. This would be, and like and she, she feels this way as well. I think this would be a, um, a pretty interesting example of anarchy, right? When there's too much, of the wrong kind of power put on people who don't know how to do it, right? A person who's a conductor has been to school for however long to learn how to do it. There are certain choices that they make to winnow out other choices. And then you can present to the group, hey, from these like myriad op options that exist out in the world, I have presented you with these five. Which one of these five would you like the most? Is much less intimidating and much more orderly and also still collaborative as opposed to like, who knows? Let's do everything. Let's just throw knowledge into the air like confetti and figure out what happens. There are people who love that kind of stuff. I think most people don't function super well in that kind of an environment. I'm just saying. Um, so I'm going to shut up here in just a minute let you, and, and, and let you guys ask me some questions if you would like to. I did want to point out this process that we did in my, in my chorus. This is maybe something that could be done in a campus group, in a club, to kind of define a sense of purpose and to define the kind of environment that people want to be in. This is from Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead. Anybody a Brene Brown person? Yeah, I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I, I, really, I mean, you're like, oh my God, a middle-aged white woman who loves Brene Brown, how <laughs> original, right? But it's, it, she, she actually is pretty great. She's got some, some pretty interesting ideas and there's some lovely Netflix specials with her. I think she's very easy to listen to and kind of a fun human, but she has this process that she likes to go through with groups where, they they take her list of values. She has like a, a list of a page full of different values or virtues or whatever. And you present it to the group, then you winnow it down to five that the group chooses, right? And it includes all kinds of different things on this list. And some of them will not be relevant to what you're talking about. Like for example, financial stability is one of the values on there. And believe it or not, my choristers were not too interested in that. So they're not every not every value applies to every person. It's this is all available online. So they wintered it down to their values being kindness, growth, collaboration, harmony, and fun. These are the things that they decided are the most important to them as an ensemble. And I actually write these up on the board, most rehearsals. And so when stuff happens in chorus, we're not sure what to do, or we're not sure how to deal with somebody's feelings or emotions or whatever's going on that day, we go back to the board and we say, okay, so these are our values. What are we gonna do about what's happening today? And it actually, again, is a way of sharing power. They are the ones who came up with these words and I am the one who's observing whether or not they're happening. 
And then I asked for them to observe themselves, to stand outside themselves, see, are we doing kindness? Are we doing growth? Are we doing collaboration? Are we doing harmony? Are we doing fun? Like, how can we weave all of this into the situation where we need to make a decision together? So how do we demonstrate these values in our actions? This is sort of a second part of the process. So you choose the words and then you go through and you talk about how that looks behaviorally. So you can kind of go down the list and see the things that they said. So these, these are, again, people who are age seven through age 17 that these all came from. Um, I do want to point out that one of my favorite things we do is question of the day. That's also their like, very favorite thing. You see under the fun thing, they, they mention it like 9,000 times <laughs> because the question of the day is something like, I'll write up on the board at the beginning. Um, if you had a soft serve ice cream machine in your house, and you could only have two flavors of soft serve, which two would they be and would you swirl them? Which seems like, you know, sort of a dumb icebreaker, right? But they start to say, like if you go around the room and everybody says their thing. And when this all started back in October of 2021, these kids had been like in their houses for a year and a half, not talking to each other. And so the idea that some adult is going to ask for their opinion in front of a group of other people is number one, a little bit kind of titillating. They're a little bit nervous about it. But number two, it was kind of delightful. Like, oh, well, I've just been hanging out in a room with my parents for like a, a year and a half. I, I'm, I'm thrilled that some other human who I don't know is asking me a question about something I've never thought about before. So these opinions start to come out. And over time, as you know, we ask more and more questions and we do more and more of these these little camps always start to, they seem to sort of develop where they're like, oh, you want mango ice cream? Oh my God, that's disgusting. I want pistachio ice cream. Like, the, and, and they'll sort of like roast each other a little bit. Or, you know, I asked them a question about candy corn. Oh my God, that was controversial. I asked them about whether or not you wear socks to bed, also super controversial. And so they would have these like very passionate opinions that they would advocate for. And it, they think that it is the best part of rehearsal to be able to have these like little mini fake fights about things that are sort of not high stakes. So I never ask them things like, what's your favorite band? Or you know, anything that, that could somehow be connected to coolness. I, I, never, I never go there. It's always about like food or animals or something really random, like whether or not you wear socks to bed. Like it's, the idea is that people learn how to articulate their own opinion to a group of people. And then also deal with the fact that some people are gonna disagree with them. And then deal with the fact that you still like those people because you all have come together around the common, not the common knowledge that you like to sing and resolve your differences together. And I have to tell you, divisiveness is an issue in our world. And if we can train young people to disagree with one another and still be friends at the end, I think we've done a lot to try to rebuild the world. That's kind of my opinion about the dumb icebreaker that is the question of the day that has somehow become like the backbone of my pedagogical technique. It's very silly, but it totally works. So the final question for today is, can this be done in my own classroom slash club slash social group, whatever? Can you do these things? Can you center human wellness wherever you go, wherever you are, in whatever environment you function? Because has anything that I've said been super complicated? No, it's all pretty simple, right? So could you do this yourself in your life? Yeah, you totally could. That's the whole deal. But I have some things that if you want to check them out, um, those are pretty easy to find. If you Google on any of that, you, you find a link to it or be able to look at it online possibly as well. So what questions do you all have? Yeah. Can this be done with, I mean, you said in the end, it can be done in our own classroom, but in terms of the focus of choral stuff, do you see this happening in theater and art? Is it particularly artistic realms or is it in anything? I think you can do it anywhere. I think anytime you are thinking about how to make your environment safer for people, not just physically safe, but like socially safe or uh, emotionally safe. You can, it, it's okay to talk about emotional safety in like a chemistry lab, right? We already talked about physical safety there. It would be like if we could somehow set up a way for people to have lower stakes access to saying what they're thinking, feeling, experiencing, 
then I think we win. I think that, that, that that's possible in any environment. I think there are a lot of offices in corporate America where this kind of stuff would like make a huge difference. I think there are places in Congress where I think, I mean, Lord knows some of these folks need to hold hands and sing songs for a little while. I'm just saying. Anyway, I, I think it can be applied in, in to some extent in basically any environment. You just have to start thinking about respecting other people, being kind to other people, and thinking about the fact that you fundamentally do not know what that person has been through today, let alone in the whole rest of their life. Other questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So you have, um, I assume you have like kids coming in very often, and do you all make them all take the Brene Brown like values list and like if so, does the values like change and how does that like affect what you do? So we've only been around since October 2021. And so we we have new choristers come in usually in September and January. We, we Everybody kind of comes in in a cohort kind of a thing. Um, we have maintained most of the folks from the very beginning. Maybe five years down the line, we think about redoing the values process. If you have more turnover on a regular basis, it might make more sense to do it more regularly. So, you know, if you have students in, in a class that's, you know, last for a semester and then next semester you have a new group, then obviously you would redo it for, for whatever. But if you retain the same personnel or at least a lot of the same personnel for a long time, I think it's okay. Or the other way of thinking about it would be, I think kindness, growth, collaboration, harmony, and fun is probably gonna work pretty well for pretty much any choral ensemble. If at some point we get to a point where we're like, you know, maybe maybe harmony, maybe it doesn't mean the same thing to us that it used to. We want to replace that with a word like diversity, whatever, like that that sort of thing could absolutely happen. But you wouldn't necessarily have to throw it all out and start from, from the word go. If you feel like you have a cultural setup that really works for you and for the group that's there, why not keep it? Other questions? If you were going to give us one tip today, like if we were going to go out and make the world better, what would be the one thing we should do? Um, hmm. I'm tempted on one hand to say exhale slowly a couple times a day. Um, I'm also tempted to say, just remember, you don't know. Like the person who cut you off in traffic, right? The person who was rude to you in the, in the cafeteria, like, and it's not being a doormat, right? It's not that you have to accept other people's crappy behavior because you don't. But there's a difference between seeing crappy behavior and saying, "Hey, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't like that," or seeing crappy behavior and being like, "You're an asshole," right? There's a, there's a difference between those two things. So somebody might be a perfectly lovely person in their in their regular life, but they just have a bad day, right? And thinking of things not as you are a so it's not, what's wrong with you? Instead it's, huh, what happened? What happened here? Be curious, right? So exhale slowly and be curious about other people. Any last questions, everybody? Thank you so much. Sorry. <laughs>